I'm going to talk about uh, Melanesia, which is where I've mostly worked for the last 15 years. Um, and I'm going to talk about the, well, when I say Melanesia, I mean Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands. There's also, of course, Vanuatu, New Caledonia and Fiji, but uh, I'll draw mainly on information from, from uh, two countries. Uh, I want to talk about the social dimensions of uh, coral reef resource management and, um, and also about the, the sort of an interaction between human population density and culture uh, when it comes to attempting various different kinds of interventions um, to uh, help save uh, coral reefs and coral reef fisheries. So the one really key fact that I'm going to talk about a lot is population density. There's a, you saw Gary's uh, material earlier today where he showed you those uh, Mural army boats. Um, Philippines has a population density of 300 and something people per square K, I think. And um, Melanesia has an astonishingly low population density. Uh, there are, of course, pockets of high concentrations of people here and there. But for the most part, there's not many people. And, and as, uh, because of that, they, they haven't, uh, the, the existence of a, of a conservation ethic uh, is al it's almost non-existent. Um, and nor should it have been, because people have never actually needed one. Uh, there's just been too few people. OK. Um, customary land and marine tenure is enshrined in the Constitution, which is, makes this region unique also uh, throughout most of the world. Whatever the, uh, the people um, at the grassroots say is the system of ownership for their, uh, their land and their reefs, uh, the government supports. Another really key... Uh, fact is that status and prestige is acquired by redistributing wealth, not by accumulating it. They have a system of competitive feasting, which anthropologists have written a great deal about, uh, and which I think is, is quite an important thing to consider when, when doing both conservation and development uh, projects in this part of the world. So these are, these are pigs at a feast, about to be redistributed uh, in, uh, in Papua New Guinea. OK, the other thing is that even though more than 85% of the, around 85% of the population live a largely subsistence lifestyle, mainly uh, farming root crops such as yams, sweet potatoes and uh, taro. Um, most people since the early 1800s um, have, have become inextricably connected with the global economy and, the, and people's desire for cash is intense and it's increasing. Okay, so as a marine biologist, I started my life as a marine biologist. Um, and I love diving and I love coral reefs. Um, but the aesthetic and scientific values that I have uh, about coral reefs are largely not shared by the people that I work with in Melanesia. Uh, their main concerns are usually economic ones. Um, another key issue is that the... When we talk... Uh, and, and, uh, and I'm... I mean, the stuff we've been hearing today has been fantastic and, and I'm keen to engage a lot more with it because I've been writing for some years now about the, the fact that we need to um, understand more about larvae and the, and the scale at which uh, any particular stock is self-replacing. And that's very important with regard to the scale of socio-political units in Melanesia because it's a very fragmented place. You've got 70 to 80 languages in Papua New Guinea and you've got 800, uh, sorry, in uh, Solomons and 800 in Papua New Guinea. And, and uh, everyone owns a, a piece of the coastline. And, and so uh, it's often not in people's economic interest to actually close off a piece of that coastline as an MPA if they're not going to reap a, uh, a net economic benefit from it. Um, so um, yeah, I've, I've been growled at uh, in the past for being a, being a pessimist about um, Melanesia, but I think um, I think this, this uh, cartoon illustrates pretty well my position. Uh, the problems are really huge they're, and, they're, um, and they're extremely complex. Uh, and, and I believe that you need uh, really good social science and, and not just economics. You need good anthropology to, to really understand how to deal with some of the conservation and management issues in this part of the world. So I quite dig this little Dilbert cartoon. Um, now, in Solomons, there's one, there's one uh, marine protected area that's been in existence for, um, I think, about 20 years. Uh, it's the Arnavan Islands Marine Conservation Area. Um, when I was working at WWF uh, in the Solomons, in, based in Gizo, which is not far from there, 
um, I used to send people, uh, I used to sort of uh, pay for my team to actually take uh, community leaders over there to see how it works because it's, I mean, it's been closed for some time. They've had, you know, minor problems with poaching, but it's, um, currently it's working really quite well. Um, there's been no measurement, of course, of spillover and no measurement of an increase in CPUE, catch per unit effort, outside of the closure, as Gary has uh, so brilliantly done for places like Apo. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not a good thing to have. Um, and it, I've just been informed by my colleague Peter Rummel here, who works for TNC in the Solomons, um, that people on the islands of Isabel and Choisel, which neighbour the uh, Arnavans, uh, who have now been to see these, uh, these, these reserves, um, have, have uh, been you know, quite uh, inspired by them and are now wanting to set up their own uh, marine protected areas. Whether they are no-take or, or cyclical, whatever, I don't really mind. I think that the, the best way to do conservation is to, is to do it in a sort of a people-first way, and uh, that's clearly happening now at last. Um, okay. Um, the really, the really key, the really urgent issues, um, I think, in Melanesia, because of this population, this low human population density, um, are to do with exportable marine commodities, uh, primarily shark fin and beche de mer. Um, so I think there, there, there are sort of a, a set of factors that we can uh, think about um, that, that sort of make it clearer what to sort of worry about first um, in this part of the world. So. So market price, uh, life history, i.e. vulnerability, we've heard a lot about that already today with sharks. Um, ease of capture, uh, you know, if it's aggregating or not, if, it, if it's uh, got a depth range that takes it out of reach, uh, if it's cryptic, uh, trochus can be quite cryptic. Um, and, and how easy it is it to store and transport to market. Uh, these things all contribute to whether a commodity is uh, hammered harder or not. So. Um, so I think the two things that are under the, are the heaviest threats in Melanesia at the moment are, are uh, some species of beche de mer and, of course, sharks. Um, and uh, I'll just give you an example. This is, uh, th these, uh, these children are on uh, the island of Wari in, in uh, Millen Bay, and, and they're harvesting um, black teat. I think it's holotheria, not black teat, sorry, uh, lollyfish, holotheria atra, um, and probably going to get almost no money for it. But they've taken most of the slugs out of their lagoon. Um, Two, two interesting examples to sort of give you an idea of differences in vulnerability. Sandfish, the one on, uh, one on your right, um, my right too, um, has, has almost been extinguished throughout the, re the region already. Um, it's a shallow lagoon species. It's uh, got a very high price relative to the other ones. Um, and it's pretty well gone. Uh, there's a few left in Western Province, I believe. Um, but it's, it's more or less been extinguished throughout most of its range because it's a it's easy to get and it's lucrative. Um, white teat, on the other hand, goes down to 40 metres uh, and it's still kind of burbling along as a fishery because people can't get the very last ones. Um, green snail is, uh, is looking pretty lonely too at the moment. Um, there's, there's very few of these left. Uh, it's not a species that most people pay much attention to because it's not really that charismatic. But uh, until you take its, its uh, periostracum off, of course. But... Um, but it's, it's disappearing. Trochus, on the other hand, is, is quite a robust uh, little species. It's, I, I think it's because it it's, can be quite, um, quite cryptic. What's that beep all about? It's not my time up, I hope. Um, yeah, it, it's able to kind of hide in the reef uh, for long periods of time. So, so even with the, uh, the serial prohibition, the tambu system that they have in many parts of Melanesia, uh, which I don't think is actually going to save the day, but um, it's, it's, good to, it's kind of a good thing to have anyway. But um, e even with the tambu system, the trochus uh, is, is, uh, can be managed. Um, clearly, those other species haven't been. Um, so you have to really kind of think laterally and in every, pretty much in every direction when you're trying to figure out you know, ways to deal with some of these problems. And, and I've been recently thinking, well, what about the government? You know, everyone wants to sort of work with communities because communities are cuddly and uh, governments are evil and corrupt. Um, and, you know, the communities love us. And, you know, there's a kind of this idea of the sort of generic global community uh, where, where all people are kind of poor and they're noble and 
Um, I, you know, that's not really been my experience, I guess. Um, I think it's much more complicated than that. Uh, and not only that, but I think you can do a lot of things with the government despite all their corruption and all their dysfunctionality and all their lack of funding and so on. Um, and I think some of these species which go through uh, one or a few points of sale can be managed quite easily and quite cheaply <coughs> with things like quotas, closed season, size limits, etc. Uh, if a bit of funding is, is pumped in, and don't forget, a lot of funding goes into community work. Uh, so how about a bit of funding to the government, you know, to actually help them do their job? Um, yeah, spags are uh, under a huge threat. I mean, this isn't a live free fish operation, but it's uh, fish areolatus, Plectromus areolatus that have been taken out of a spag uh, at uh, Moravo Lagoon. Um, this is a fishery that can probably be best managed by the government just saying, no, no more licences. <laughs> Just shut it down. It's a stupid fishery. Um, it's, you know, it's not going to make that much money anyway, uh, and it's going to be highly destructive. Um, now here's an example of uh, the governor of Millen Bay Province actually taking on the National Fisheries Authority, and it's a little bit counter to what I'm trying to say because um, uh, the National Fisheries Authority generally is doing a much better job than it used to, but in this particular case they allowed a bunch of uh, pear trawlers, these evil things that sling a big net between two great big boats and hoover up pretty much everything uh, that gets in the way, uh, were allowed to go down to Millen Bay and the, and the, um, the governor uh, caught them and sent them all home. So there's a nice example of like, good enlightened leadership actually doing something about a serious fishery threat. Um, and of course there's also the problem of when you don't have a government Um, I worked in Solomons before, during and after the coup of June 2000, so I got to observe what happens to a weak state when it becomes a non-state. Um, and it, and it's, it was quite a salutary lesson for me because, you know, um, I'd much rather have a weak state. Um, <laughs> a strong state would be even better, but uh, no state is, is terrible for resource management. You know, it was just complete chaos. Uh, and everything was going to pieces and eventually I think um, the Howard government got worried that maybe uh, Copacis was going to show up and start doing something, so they sent Ramsey up there, the regional assistance mission to Solomon Islands, and they uh, fixed things up and scared everybody into hiding their guns um, and started working with the government and they're fixing it all up. And I've now been working with the, uh, the thing called the Ramsey People's Survey, which is a, a, an assessment of, uh, well, it's a survey to find out how Solomon Islanders are finding life post Ramsey. It's uh, quite an interesting exercise. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, and um, not surprisingly, 90% of Solomon Islanders don't want Ramsey to leave, even though the uh, current Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands dearly would like them to leave. Um, but I'll just mention that he happened to be the guy who was in the post-coup administration um, as well. And uh, I won't say any more about that. Um, but... Um, Okay, so I'll, I'll now talk about, I just want to come back to um, a conservation ethic and, and the sort of the relationship between communities and government when it comes to management and conservation. So logging is the big deal uh, in Solomon, both Solomons, well, it's, it, mining is a bigger deal in Papua New Guinea, but it's, it's the biggest deal in the Solomons. Uh, it makes the most money uh, and it's been appallingly badly managed. Um, pretty much since the logging boom began in the, in the 80s. Um, the uh, orange line is the estimated uh, sustainable uh, cut, and of course it was completely ignored. Um, and it was more, more ignored during the coup when uh, the, um, Tommy Chan, the, uh, the minister at the time, uh, held a big party and gave everyone a license who wanted one. Um, and the cut went up from 600 thousand to about a million cubes a year. Uh, so the current modelling shows that the timber is going to run out completely by about 2014. Um, and the uh, recovery of the natural forest is going to take rather a long time. Um, it's not all that grim. Um, this, this, uh, this just gives you an idea of the extent over which uh, logging has happened. The, these graphs were provided by uh, an AusAid project uh, run by Ross Andrewatha, by the way. Um, yeah, the blue boxes are the uh, already harvested licences, so most of the Solomons have already been logged over. Um, but everybody's been busy planting teak and mahogany. Um, so 
modelling the projected revenue uh, when we include the teak and mahogany actually is not quite so scary. Um, but there will be a time when I think pressure on marine resources is going to is going to kind of ramp up a bit. Uh, you know, from about 2012 to say 20, 2020. So, why is development not happening? Um, what's the problem? There are, there are external factors and there are internal factors. I'll talk a little bit about the internal ones, the cultural issues. Um, when you make money from shark fin or logging, you can spend it on school fees or um, hospitals, and you can also spend it on beer and girls and trips to the casino um, and other ways of enhancing your status if you're a bloke. It's a highly gendered thing, this. Um, so this is a very uh, nasty little ploy by the South Pacific breweries to encourage men to keep drinking their children's school fees because they might win them back when they get to the end of the carton. <laughs> so I just want to talk a little bit about capitalism and, and the, the sort of the, you know, when, when you try to do like an MPA, uh, people will immediately say, well, what's in it for us? So you can say, um, some spillover in five years. And they'll say, right, see you later, sunshine. <laughs> what's in it for us now? Uh, and so, you know, people have kind of been outsiders who, who, uh, whose values about coral reefs aren't shared by the locals usually have to come up with some kind of carrot. Um, and the carrots have, um, have usually been in the form of capitalist enterprise. Um, uh, this is not to do with a conservation project. This is actually an EU project. Um, but it's an example of one of the many uh, capitalist enterprises that just keep crashing and burning like a cracked record um, for the last forever, pretty much. Um, so what I want to just do is, is try to explain why capitalism doesn't work in Melanesia and, and uh, the eminent um, economic anthropologist Chris Gregory, who's actually based here at ANU, has written some really nice lucid words about this. Um, the Grameen Bank, the famous Grameen Bank, which does the microfinance um, projects, that model was tried in Papua New Guinea and it didn't work. Um, so Chris has kind of done some, done some analysis on this and you know, basically come up with the idea that, well, the rice economies of Asia, where this thing works so beautifully, are surplus production economies. Um, and the Melanesian economy is a, is a root crop um, economy which is basically aimed at, at just being at, at sufficiency. Um, and, and so people aren't used to producing a surplus and, and husbanding a resource, which is what you do with an MPA, by the way. Um, so just, just to read sort of a little extract from his paper, economics is ultimately about relationships between people. These relationships are always complicated, but the types of complications we find in Papua New Guinea have few parallels elsewhere in the world. Rice cultures are characterised by a recognisable pattern of complicated social relations, uh, which, which the term penny capitalism captures. However, the pattern of social relationships found in uh, root crop cultures does not re replicate this. As such, uh, an institutional replication of the Grameen bank type would seem to have very little chance of success. So that, to me, that's a really a key bit of knowledge, you know, that there, there is a very important cultural barrier to capitalism. And it takes the form of this intense social pressure to be generous. You achieve status by being generous, by giving stuff away. Uh, so when people get a handful of cash, as you do when you have to run a business, um, all their relatives come and say, give me some, and they have to give it away. Uh, so I'll give you a little um, an example of, of a, an interview snippet. You're moving me along. <laughs> uh, give me about five minutes. Um, <laughs> OK. Um, I think there's a, there's a, there's a kind of a trade-off between, between this, uh, this, this uh, prestige economy and, and population density. So I think that ultimately when the population density rises, people are going to be forced into capitalism. You can't get away from it. It's all around us. We're embedded in it. Um, and some people do it. Some people do it pretty well. Um, and, it, and it's a good thing in many ways because you can achieve an economy of scale and, you know, things work better when people cooperate more. Uh, so here you go. I think one, the one-talk system is no good uh, for the business because when the one-talks, that's your relatives. 
uh, borrow money or goods from your stores. Most times they don't repay and the business will break down. Peer pressure is very hard to avoid in running a business. If you do not assist your relatives, if you have a business, there will be a row between the family and black magic will come into play too and the business will break down. Now, this, this uh, is classic, okay? There's a lot of data that replicates this, this little vignette. Okay, on the other hand, people from high patches of high density like Malata, uh, you know, the Malatans were involved in the coup. They were the people who were trying to uh, move on to uh, land on Guadalcanal and causing trouble. Those people are already better at capitalism because, because they have no fallback position. They have to do it. So, so there, is, there is this kind of, you know, this, this nexus between uh, population density and capitalist um, modes of, um, of production. So the problem is ecological degradation uh, usually is the price that you pay for this transition to capitalism. Um, so are there any cap cap alternatives to capitalist models um, of ecologically sustainable development that would work for the low density populations of, of Melanesia? I think there are, there are quite a lot. Um, groups like, um, like um, uh, ACR are doing great projects. Uh, sort of aquaculture type things. There's, there's a lot of little sort of miscellaneous things that, that can be tried. Um, what, what else can be tried? Um, but before that, how much development is enough? You know, that there's this kind of moral dimension to this. And, uh, you know, I think that, that the economic differences between our country and these other countries are, are, are something we need to keep thinking about. And, of course, they are always thinking about them. Those people... Uh, don't haven't forgotten about that stuff, uh, and they're and they're very uh, and they're not not very happy about it. Um, so you know, life expectancy is generally lower, literacy is definitely lower, and development is all about trying to crank those things up. Um, on the other hand, how happy is everybody? Now, the Happy Planet Index is something I recommend everyone have a look at. It's a fantastically brilliant study, uh, easy to to find. Happy Planet Index, just Google it. Um, so the question I'd just like to ask here is how happy would we be if we took a cut of six-sevenths of our rate of, uh, of our level of affluence or our level of consumption? The ecological footprint is basically a metric that calculates carbon, water, uh, consumption, etc. Um, I'll just leave that hanging there. My, my big answer, of course, is education. I th I've been banging on about education for a long time, and I finally uh, had the chance to actually do some, uh, ironically funded by a mining company. Um, but I've got some great products here um, that are all polished, and we, uh, we collaborated with the, uh, with the um, curriculum development uh, division of the Papua New Guinea Education Department to do this work, uh, and I'd really like to replicate it. Uh, replicate the format um, with uh, ideas about larvae and all of the ideas about resilience. Um, uh, there's so much fantastic knowledge in this group that could be easily harnessed. We've communicated some very complicated ideas in this stuff. Acid rock drainage, acid rain, uh, all kinds of stuff. And, um, and I think it's, it's not actually that hard to communicate really key things that, that uh, are to do with with the uh, relationship between fishing pressure and recruitment strength, particularly with fisheries. Um, and, and larvae is the key thing. People don't know about larvae because they don't see them. And so they come up with all kinds of other ideas about you know, where fish come from. OK. Um, so you know, our, our education work included very rigorous diagnostic testing uh, of the materials. And uh, the communities in New Ireland really loved it. Um, and so we've done pretty well. So. I'm at the end. Um, <laughs> so, as I said, I think educational materials that clearly demonstrate the links between overfishing and recruitment failure. Plus, we could do all kinds of other stuff that, we, that people have been talking about today. I don't think it'd be that hard. And I think they would help people move towards, you know, doable models of management autonomously and, uh, you know, um, and, and they would own it. They would own it to a much greater degree. So I think the emphasis on ecosystem function and resilience is much better than hotspot slash biodiversity, the myers mittermeier thing. Um, more aid dollars, please, for fisheries departments. Um, Long-term, national level, locally relevant fisheries education. 
um, socially and for generally speaking, socially informed, sustainable and coordinated development assistance, not criticism and punishment and cracking the whip and saying, why aren't you doing capitalism better? Um, and environmentally enlightened leadership. I think that's a huge, a huge thing that, uh, that can be fostered more. There are, there are key people involved in some of the big successes in Melanesia. Uh, Willy Atu, Manuai, um, Matapai, um, Paul Lokhani, you know, all these people um, are doing great things. And, and if people like that can be, can be sort of fostered and helped, they'll, they'll achieve a great deal. Okay, thanks very much. I'm done.